So to kick this off, I wanted to ask the panelists to um, maybe you know give a you know, brief thoughts about all the you know the, the data, maybe the horizontal data integration, which we mostly was about yesterday, and how we can better uh, actualize those into informing decisions. Um, you know, we've heard about a lot of tools, a lot of uh, approaches, a lot of new data that's coming online. And, you know, what are some of the barriers to actually getting those into um, informing decisions? And alternatively, how maybe the decision um, analysis uh, context can help inform where we should go in terms of the big data kind of uh, data integration. So, anyone want to start? Well, I'm, I'm going to answer your question with a question, which is something, it's funny, we were at the bar talking about a lot of these things last night. Um, uh, one thing I've been surprised by is the extent to which policymakers, well, a lot of the people who do the kind of work that we do don't engage with policymakers. I was recently invited to a policy conference. And, you know, basic stuff that I work on, you know, basic ideas, concepts, and in, in, in engineering are not even, you know, remotely um, um, known things in, in amongst, uh, you know, Chiefs of staff of, of congressmen, and um, um, and that's been a surprise to me. So I'm 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 I guess I'm not answering your question, but I, I think that um, one of the things that I think uh, it that would be you know great for researchers and scientists is to really focus on trying to make um, more inroads with uh, with the decision makers, and we just don't do it because the incentives aren't there. My understanding of the way science works is that it strips out context. Um, you know, the orbit of the planets around the sun is a perfect way to understand gravity. Because when I was in high school, there was like, imagine a friction-free environment, you know, in an ideal whatever the heck it was. Science strips away context, but decision-making requires context. So if we're going to do data integration in the absence of context, we haven't got to the decision analysis or the decision-making. We need the information to flow from the right to the left. What is the decision context? What are the alternatives that present? And then that might guide us in how to integrate the data sets, what to ignore, what to pay attention to. The difficulty with that, I mean, the research now becomes more applicable. The difficulty is it's less generalizable because it's only suitable for that context. And we, I think, the way that we've been trained, we resist that as scientists. We're looking for the, the context-free, generalizable knowledge. So really spinning on this idea of storytelling, um, and I'm kind of a little blown away by it, mostly because people keep telling me I'm a storyteller. Now I know why. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> so you know, we've, been, <laughs> we've been out talking with these sorts of change makers and you know, chiefs of staff, you know, showing them kind of you know, air quality and data and, and trying to put some context in it. And they're, they're like, I don't even know how to start. Um, and so, like, putting in the story, putting in the context, saying, like, here are the kinds of decisions you could make with this data, and then, and then they feed back to us, and then they say, okay, great, here's what we would need. Um, so then that could direct sort of how we might think about how we sample, what we measure, et cetera, et cetera. So we're coming at it not necessarily from a pure science point of view, but definitely from a what kind of scientific information and engineering do we need to do to put together so that we can inform that? And it, it's this design thinking idea, you know, kind of out of, out of Stanford. And these are ideas of how you actually start to integrate that together. Um, and that's beginning to, to, to trickle more and more, at least into the tech world. But I think that there could be a great idea of trickling some of that material into the uh, broader scientific world as well. So you mentioned in your talk um, some engagement with communities. Can you d elaborate a little bit more on that and how maybe that is informed? Maybe it might be an, an example of how to you know bring the context um, you know into the into the data uh, um, and how it's and how it's collected and analyzed. I, I can give the example of a big win, I guess, where we were talking with the city of Los Angeles and their chief of staff and, and their sort of environmental people. And I was showing, here's the different ways we can kind of chop up the data, and like schools and distributions and, and, and different streets and streets with trees and streets without trees and sort of the different ways you think about we design our cities. And hotspot identification um, is a big thing that sort of we think about for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. And we showed a methane hotspot um, in this area and then you go look at the map because that's available and super cool, and it was the um, it was the 
charging station. It was the methane fueling station for their best fleet. And it was huge, you know, not unexpected. Right. Um, but they were, they were making a big argument and still are for lots of good reasons for push for bus electrification. He took a picture of that map that day and went immediately to this next meeting where they were talking about bus electrification. And he could show them this, you know, here's one of the reasons why methane is a difficulty. Uh, and so that was sort of a, a win that you know, I wouldn't have known that that was something that was really important for that kind of decision he's trying to make. So um, mm -hmm. the, the, the schools, one, really resonates with a lot of communities because then they immediately are, you know, what can we do? Uh, plant trees around things. Let's do... Uh, Let's do if if you have the continuation of data, you know, do the do the actual intervention, do different intervention trials, um, and then come up with the best way to move forward to make this school better. So those are some wins that that we've had, and, and and some of the feedback that we've gotten. But we're actually doing a big tour of a lot of areas of California in the next two or three weeks. I'll have more answers then, which doesn't help today, but nonetheless. One of the things that impressed me during your talk is you put all those maps up. And anyone who sees a map, like they're, they're looking for the you are here. Uh, you know, they're relating to the map, like wh where am I or, or what does it have to do with me? When you told the story of being in your car and turning on the air conditioning, the people who were like on their laptops and checking their email, like, wait a minute, what? Do I, what was the button that she said? Did I do the research or the not? And immediately they related, like they're making it a story in their head and they have a decision context that they were. So you gave, uh, you know, the methane heat map, you gave him something that was emotionally salient that he could relate to right away and attempt to put into action. There's, um, there's something really useful about that, but there's also the, the bias that people grab onto the emotionally salient aspect of whatever we show them to the neglect of everything else. And they may call, or they may make decisions based upon that salience that they later learn to regret. So Tom, you you were talking uh, like in your example with the um, the laundry detergent. That's sort of a corporate level decision making. Um, but now you're just you're talking actually more about an individual level decision making, um, which I think has is a very different context. And I think a lot of the work that we that was discussed yesterday on the medicine precision medicine side is also maybe more geared towards informing individuals in their own personal decisions as opposed to sort of top-down decisions. So do, do you guys have any comments about um, you know, that, range of that range of decision makers from individuals to communities to governments and um, you know, the, the challenges associated at each of those levels in terms of the data integration and, and how, how having the right data and the right analysis to inform decisions? Um, yeah, I, I, um, I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, you know, I think as a, as a when, you're, when you're doing machine learning, you tend to be thinking about the corporate level decision making and not the individual because you tend to be um, focused mostly on trying to improve the processes and the efficiency of various, you know, parts of the operation of a company. Um, and you think about, you know, Facebook, automatically tagging images or, you know, these sort of standard machine learning problems, um, designing of self-driving cars for uh, uh, detecting pedestrians. Um, I guess you're seeing now more and more uh, an implementation of um, data science methods like on the phone to help you make decisions about, right. um, about that. But, but, I mean, I think that a lot of the interest in machine learning and the data science tools that I've worked with mostly was driven by corporate interest and only recently we've seen it actually try to affect individual decision makers. And I think that um, that trend towards more of the individual hasn't completely um, taken the field or affected the field as much. Um, so I don't have as much, I don't have a good, um, great answer to that question, but. I'll just think out loud because yeah. that's kind of what we're supposed to do, right? But right. Um, yeah. uh, I think that some of the machine learning and the tools and, and, and the sort of internet of things and whatnot uh, helps support both contexts from the same sort of data set and the same inputs and, and things that you have to hand. So for instance, if I, depending on if the New York Times did some really cool graphics analysis and visualization storytelling on that uh, uh, powder versus liquid thing, I would change how, perhaps change how I purchased stuff. Mm. Um, 
and and so it's a matter of how you again I get back to the story how you tell the story to the different sorts of of places um, of course the corporate decision making is more likely to give the money to support like getting the information you need to put together to make those decisions um, and then it's a matter of like using that to reach different audiences and I, I thought about that a lot with our data because a person can see how they're going to move through the map and can have a right. tool that personally tells them how do I not have an asthma attack today. At the same time, the city can use the tool to alter the way they're designing their So like cities. on the Google so, Maps, they have like avoid highways, avoid tolls, avoid asthma attacks. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's going to be a button soon on, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, we want, we want the air quality information. I'd like to have all kinds of information just as ubiquitous as GPS was, which used to be just a military tool. And, uh, you know, and now the, the traffic and, and weather apps. So, maybe, maybe let me add one thing to my following from what you said. Um, I'm going to add one more comment to what I said, um, which is that um, you know initially we were working on in Flint in this project in Flint we were working on um, trying to provide a resident focused app, um, and we wanted to do much more complicated things about showing sharing a lot of information about what we knew about various homes and residents and the water quality in different areas. We actually scaled that down dramatically to basically. Binaries like are you extremely risky or are you like moderately risky, um, and it, th th that was because of um, policy. Basically, public health officials just said you shouldn't share information with with individuals, and that was sort of interesting to us. We thought, well, shouldn't more information be better? It seems like in the public health space, there's like this push against um, being per totally open um, and that sort of don't don't give more, don't give people information to hang themselves with. And that was interesting for us. You know, that was not the experience that I was expecting to have in this process. Um, so, and in some sense, that's partly why I think we transitioned a lot of our efforts to this replacement program, which is, you know, corporate level, you know, sort of not corporate level, but, you know, it was the city, you know, Flint City Council or uh, Flint um, City officials that were making those decisions. I will tell you that um, after we did that and we sort of spent all of our time folk talking to these policymakers or, the, you know, decision makers, um, I got on the call with a, a a professor at Kettering who lives in Flint or yeah, lives in Flint and, and I remember him saying to us, you know, he, contractors came to his house and replaced his, his line and he didn't know for months that he had a service line and, we, and I, you know, we said to him, you know, well, we looked up his house and we said, oh yeah, our model says it's an 82% or, you know, I don't remember, an 87% chance of having a service line. And he said, you know, that would have been helpful to know because um, originally we thought maybe our neighbor didn't and we thought we didn't and, you know, what? we didn't take any action as a result of that. You know, when we felt pretty bad about that, I mean, he didn't blame us for that, of course, but, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of the trade-off between being concerned with the health issues of, or public health issues of revealing too much information versus, you know, what would, you know, what would be really useful for people to know. That was something that we didn't, I don't think we managed that trade-off very well, and I don't think we, as computer as a computer scientist, I don't really understand that issue, and it, it seemed like, it seemed very awkward to me. Um, I'm really glad you asked the question, and it's taken me, you know, five minutes of thinking about it and listening to Jake and Melissa to sort it out. The public health concerns that worry me the most, um, there are not the ones that I can directly trace to environmental exposures. It might be obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and all of the, the sort of non-infectious ailments. Right now, we're treating these from the bottom. Uh, in medicine, patient by patient. Oh, here's your statins. Oh, here's your blood pressure medication. You should really probably drop 30 pounds. And I mean, every patient gets the same lecture. But now I'm thinking about this as a civil engineer. What's my responsibility? Um, Melissa is driving around the highways. Um, who put those highways there? Um, you know, Jake is ripping out service lines. But who built that infrastructure? From the top down, we constrain the decisions that the individual has available to them. Mm -hmm. Then they may, if you believe in this hyper-rationality, they may have some sort of optimization within the choices that are presented to them. So it is the engineer, in a way, that has created this environment that is making us sick. The medical establishment really isn't well prepared to deal with what our cars and our highways and our infrastructure is, is causing us to adapt to. And I say adapt, but it's a maladaptation. Mal yeah. yeah, exactly. Risha, did you still have some? Well, if I may, I just wanted to give a quick uh, example of why I don't like averages. In a recent IRIS publication on an endocrine disruptor chemical, and the, the end point of interest was retained nipples in male offspring of mothers exposed. 
and I was amazed to see that there was a more than 3,000-fold increase in retained nipples. And for those of you who don't know mice, they have 10 when they have them all. And so how can you have a 3,000-fold increase? Well, they averaged the number of nipples in the control where only a few male mice had any nipples. So on average, they had, I think, 0.01 nipples. <laughs> and you get your more than 3,000-fold increase. You've got to be very careful. And th those were the only data presented in that version of the document. So you had no idea what the control number was, no idea what the actual increase was. And clearly, there are also other ways, I know, to take averages besides assuming continuous values. Um, a median would have been much better. But even there, you're going to get partial nipples at some point. I've also seen publications when I'm working on pathogen risks where you know the threshold is 0.6 viruses, which I don't think are an effective unit. So averages have utility, and they can often solve some problems, but they aren't the answer to everything. And you, uh, yeah. So um, uh, two things. One. I ended with two quotes from John Tukey. There's a third one I really like, but I can't find the actual writing. And it's, it goes along the lines of the job of a statistician, but you could fill an engineer or data scientist here, is to arrange the data so that you don't have to be a statistician to understand it, which I think is part of the storytelling, right? Now, if you Google don't have to be a statistician to understand it, you find pages of quotes that say that. So that's just, um, I think the storytelling is critical, and I think that's important. The other thing I want to talk about is training people to live in the middle of this diagram. So I went to graduate school in an engineering school. I've been teaching in schools of public health for 26 years. Public health students and engineering students are both very zealous. They're problem solvers. They want to change the world. They, they really build off of each other. But it would be great to get them talking to each other. So if you look at the Innovation Prize at Georgia Tech every year, they show this on our local PBS channel, half of the products that the design teams put together address some public health goal. It's either a non-flushing toilet or it's water filter system or things like that. And we've had examples like the Life Straw won all these design of I can drink, I can filter my drinking water. But if you roll it out into a third world country, you know, no one gets the water for themselves. They get it for their family. So there's no use. It, 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 it doesn't get implemented, even though it does a lot of cool stuff. And I've been in seminars and remote sensing people talking about finding malaria from satellite maps and talking to the people who actually implement bed net programs on the ground and talk to the communities. And these, they just don't talk to each other. They don't. They stop listening. And so, you know, a lot of what we've done over the last day and a half is very interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. We have people from all sorts of different fields here. How do we create the next generation that doesn't wait till they're sort of introduced to the problem and they stay open to learning. So you know, moving from a math setting to a policy setting in the local, you learn a lot, but how do we make people open to doing that? So I hesitate to bring it up because I bring it up to our dean and I say, I think we should do a public health engineering program, but I don't want to run it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they can typically say, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't you set it up? But I mean, I do think there's a space here that we're not taking advantage of because the people we want to work on these problems in our fields need to, pl need to recognize they don't know everything about it and somebody else knows an important part that they don't and it'd be great if the two of them learned to listen to each other. So I, you know, I think training programs are, uh, I'm saying the same thing over and over, but all three of you are coming in a zone where you're in that middle space and I'd just be interested in your experiences both sort of in training and your staff and you know, how, do you, how do you pull people in and, and, and tell the stories across those? Um, most of us are staying at the Hotel Monaco if we're here from out of town. Uh, okay, so you may have had the experience that I had. How many people took the stairs besides me? Okay, uh, that's not like everybody. Um, if we were in a different building, if we were in a newer hotel, we wouldn't even find stairs. They wouldn't have stairs. It would be like a fire escape. But in the Hotel Monaco, because it's older, um, the stairs are still kind of nice. This is an architectural rather than a civil engineering feature. But it's the, 
uh, relationship between design and public health. Design creates certain affordances and constraints. And I love this idea of engineering and public health. There is a new NSF-funded sustainability research network. Um, a new Ramaswamy is the PI, and it's out of the University of Minnesota. And it is looking at this issue. So, um, you know, maybe your dean is like, hey, you should write a $12 million proposal on that. Uh, <laughs> I think there's room for a lot more work on the relationship between civil infrastructure and especially these non-infectious diseases. So a quick comment and follow-up to that. Um, one of the things that has just happened uh, here at the National Academies is the launch of a new initiative, which is the Environmental Health Matters Initiative, which is explicitly trying to bring together, for the first time, I think, in a very concerted way, bringing in the National Academy of Engineering to work with the board, the uh, National Academy of Science and the National Academy of Medicine at this intersectional space. So we have this opportunity, the, you know, the new NSF Center. There is um, growth in this space, so I think that's... I'm very encouraging. And Sign me up for that, John. Yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> not, my, not my signing up, but we'll get, uh, f folks in the room are hearing that. Um, I, I had a comment and, a, and maybe a, a bit of a question. You know, we started um, the day talking about uh, data science and data scientists. And when we started talking about data integration, we were talking about ontologies and data sets and platforms and interoperability of digital stuff. And we ended up today talking about storytelling. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, the, my, my first reaction to that, you know, what are the implications of that? It, it kind of says to me that we are at a point where the human brain is just much, much better at data integration than anything that we've constructed yet, right? But the question is, and then, you know, at the beginning of the day, we also talked about, well, we don't want to necessarily constrain ourselves to doing things the way humans do. We don't want to drive a car, you know, with a computer the way a human drives a car. And I'm just wondering, you know, as we are, you know, we're certainly creating artificial intelligence that can tell stories, right? Um, but I haven't heard that brought in. And I'm just wondering if anybody has ideas on ways of creating narratives from data that's a different thing, a very different thing than what we've been talking about in terms of data integration. Um, you know, it is an impart, imparting of meeting. And we are creating artificial intelligence that has meaning, right? We're creating artificial intelligence, you know, caretakers for people who can convey emotion and meaning to them. And I'm just wondering if anybody sees a space there that we're heading towards. I want to answer that one because um, I think it's a really good point. And I, what I think is interesting about actually the particular transitions that have been happening in the machine learning community, um, and I think to a large extent this is why um, statisticians um, uh, find machine learning to be kind of an awkward field. For those of you who, who don't know, there's a, a little bit of a debate about whether machine learning is actually just a subfield of statistics or vice versa. <laughs> um, um, but the, the, the move towards a lot of the recent advances in, um, in a AI and machine learning, which has been driven a lot by this thing called deep learning, which you may have heard of, um, uh, has been actually away from narrative. And that's one of the challenges, I think, is that basically you build these models that essentially have zero narrative. They're amazing. They can detect humans, they can produce language, right? They can predict what the next word in a sentence is gonna be, but they don't have any interpretability. And um, that's, uh, that's been a big challenge, and in some sense it's pushing against actually the direction that you seem to be saying we should go in. Um, so we're, what I think you're gonna see, and I mean, I mean, it's gonna happen that in the next five or 10 years, um, things are gonna become more black boxes, and we're gonna have no idea what's going on, for better or worse. And then, and then of course, the robots are gonna kill us all, so. <laughs> With that, I think we, or do you have one last nice comment? I guess I, I just wanted to speak as someone that <clears throat> certainly knows a ton of academics but doesn't work in that field myself, um, that just making it clear that there are a variety of career choices for engineers and broadening sort of what they're exposed to in terms of like you can go out and be sort of a storyteller or you can work in public health or you can do these things. Uh, just even knowledge of options I think might help um, with this sort of disconnect, because um, if, if, I mean, God, I, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 22. Oh, my God. And, and, and so I was like, well, you're going to go work for Amico or whatever it is. There's like this limited set of options. And so having just conversations or bringing people in or, what, or just role models or just places where engineers can go out and, and interact, scientists interact in the fields in different ways, um, and having like the, the visualization books and 
XKCD, you know, uh, are great examples where that is beginning to happen and, and maybe just having that be more broadly talked about. Here with, uh, do you want to? If you don't mind. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> sticking on this theme with storytelling, uh, the, the data is, is meant to be unbiased. And, and I hand it to somebody who's supposed to make a decision from it. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that decision is inherently biased, uh, political, if you will. Uh, if for me to, to, to tell somebody the importance of, of my data or, or here's what we can glean from it and tell that narrative, tell that story, which, which requires to, to push that uh, emotional point in somebody to say, you know what, something needs to be done. We really have to do this and not let it put, go to the back burner. Uh, that takes me away from being the scientist, supposed to be the, the unbiased scientist. Uh, and I feel like that will then uh, put me into that, into that political realm of, oh, don't, don't listen to whatever he said from his group in his university because, well, he's inherently biased toward protecting people and things along those lines. He's not uh, poisoning them. Right, right. right. <laughs> so, uh, so I feel like there's, there's, there's a bridge that needs to be crossed that bridge has to be crossed for us to get that message out. Uh, how can we do that and save our, our, young, our young careers uh, as scientists? Uh, perhaps that, that answer is not going to come out today, uh, but here it is. I want to hear what Katya has to say. Well, Katya. Uh, yeah. so actually, um, because of that meeting, some of you might have missed uh, AAAS. And AAAS, um, once a year, is a wonderful event that brings together 5,000 people to really have uh, these kind of discussions with policymakers, with people from the press, from science museums, and others that deeply care, in many cases, about bringing good science to many, many people out there, to libraries, to, again, um, museum infrastructures are a great delivery mechanism. And yes, it takes you away from getting citation counts. Mm -hmm. You have to make that choice. But as an engineer, I'm totally happy to make that choice, because I want whatever I do to have an impact. And so, um, Maybe you don't recommend it to those which still need to get tenure, but as soon as you have that sign-off, you know, the box is checked, just go out, go into libraries, go work with them, go to museums, especially science museums, and work with them closely. They are welcoming you with open arms, and if you don't have much time, just go once a year to AAAS and run a panel or attend or provide input to panels. I think this is a wonderful and very effective way to impact a lot of decision-making out there. Well, I will wear that badge proudly. Thank you. All right. Uh, we, are, we, do, we are going on to a general discussion. So if these are um, not directed at the panelists, then are, are these? I, I can uh, make it general. OK. <laughs> so, so, so generally speaking, <laughs> just it builds off the last question. Okay. Maybe yeah. it, it'll, it'll yeah. be a beautiful transition to our general discussion True. if I offer it as a friendly amendment. Um, in the 1800s, the London Statistical Society was being founded. Um, it turned into the Royal Statistical Society, and those of you who've read their journals know that their little logo is a sheaf of wheat. And a lot of us think that's because of the agricultural trial influence. The actual first um, motto for the, the London Royal Statistical Society was a, a Latin phrase, aliexis exterendum, which means let the others thresh it out. And, <laughs> and the idea was, the data comes to us, we do stuff with it, we give you your numbers back, and you figure out what it means. Because unlike today, it was a very politically charged environment, and the people were pushing numbers around. But they, they don't have the statement anymore, because I think you, you know, this is to Katya's point, and the point of the whole panel, and I think most of the sessions there. Now we've connected all the dots. All right. um, I think you do better work if you understand what you're using. Um, and so there is this idea that there's something totally objective about the data, but I, you know, you're still collecting it somehow, and there's some selection process that has that you. This was good, and this isn't. I'm not including this. I am including that. And I think, you know, I think I just want to live in the mess of that, and then recognize I don't know it all. So that's why going around the circle is helpful. But you know, we do get this message every once in a while that. I'm just doing the calculations, I'm just doing the data science, I'm just doing the prediction, here's my answer. And you know, I think it's not, is it the answer, but is it better than we had before? 
And I think a lot of the talks, I'll do this again, a lot of the talks we had are all str struggling with, all, you can come at that from a lot of different si sides. It's not just better computing. It's not just better data. It's not just better statistics. It's a mindset, of a, a little bit of humility. I'm doing the best job I can now, but I also know I could do better. And that's what I think keeps us going. I, I don't have a question with that. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Just a little bit of context. Um, I think part of the, so I agree with everything you said, but I'm also conscious of delivering the material in a way that you have a shot where you're in a very different field. Um, you have a shot of connecting more dots. Uh, so I'm trying to understand, you know, there's whole communities doing user modeling to try to understand what the receiver might want to see. Um, and try to put it in context so that they can make sense of it and so that they might may find it more actionable. So the behavioral health people, the user modeling people, um, I'm working with an architect to, to do data journeys, to try to do data journalism, to try to let people understand the data or let the data speak. And then keep track of what the statisticians have done and keep track of where it came from so that you can dive down if you want to. But I think this brings together the big team and the context. We can't be in our silos. Okay, so with that, I, I'm going to I'll hold you to the till we get to the full discussion. So because I want to let thank our panelists once again for this session and then let them sit down so they're not the target of, of everything. And then I'm going to turn it over to, to Patrick for uh, our final um, roundtable discussion.